recaffeinated and revitalized. Okay, so we, these are some of the traditional research designs that we can find for some experimental case studies, surveys, uh, action research, action research. Anybody have done action research? No? Uh, that takes a little bit longer. You are an agent of change within the organization and you keep on changing those things. Case studies, a lot of us do case studies. Uh, just be careful because if you don't do them right, then the case studies get a bad name. And a lot of the case studies, uh, people, who are, people who are against case studies, they say, well, oh, it's bad. No, it's because of sloppy researchers. You have grounded theory, which is both a research design and also a data analysis type. <laughs> Archival research. <coughs> and then comparative analysis of different units. Very traditional ones. There are many others. You have critical action research. Uh, you have a bunch of other ones. These are the traditional ones. Uh, I've collected a number of methodology books trying to see how do I choose my methodology. Breiman, who was writing for business students, proposed three conditions. What type of research question am I posing? Is it a why, a what, or a how much, or a how? How much control do I have as a researcher? And that also impacts us as editors, because then you have to see the other side. If I have full control, then I can do a case study, or I can do actual research. If you have no control, then you, can, you, have, you have to do all the tasks. Is it about today's problems, today's phenomena, or is it about the past? Or are we comparing the past and the present? Then Yin, who is the guru of case studies, proposed three dimensions. Are there any causal connections? Sometimes there are, especially in the natural sciences. A leads to B. In the social sciences, A leads to B and B leads to A, and then it will be difficult to create those cause effects. Can I generalize the behavior of one woman of survey? And that's the same, same one as this one. That's fine, not a problem. We also have all the types of limitations. What are the regulations of the particular university or the particular journal? What are the policies of that journal? Yeah. Are the editors supposed to be doing proofreading or not? How many of you do proofreading of your journals? Uh, yes, I just got you. Uh, it's very tiring, and it is our policy not to do it, although sometimes we do it. What's the context of the research? How much money was there available for that particular research? If I go and study the purple turtles in the Galapagos, I might need to fly over there. I might need to stay there for five years to see if the green turtles ever turn purple. I need a lot of money. That uh, table that I created for my particular PhD to help me decide which type of methodology methods were the right ones, the adequate ones for my particular question. Because I should have put the question so they would have a little bit of understanding. But just to give you an idea of how you can decide the methods, you can help the authors decide the methods too. A research method, as we've seen before, it's a way of collecting data and analyzing that data. Provide a framework within you, which you can move. Gives you the scope of that, the boundaries. Uh, they help collect data, either theoretical or empirical. And they can be general information or particular to your research. Not very complicated. As I said before, you have quantitative, how much? and the qualitative quite quiet. Um, and that we've already discussed about the, the paradigms, epistemologies, and ontologies, and which one falls in what. And sometimes you're all deductive, sometimes you're inductive, sometimes you're a little bit deductive, a little bit inductive, or vice versa. They are also given by, again, the research questions, the time, 
the skill of the researcher. I received a number of papers from prestigious universities in Europe, some of the oldest universities in Europe, where they are training the scholars extremely well in statistics, extremely well. But they are trying to do exploratory research with statistics. Different paradigms. It doesn't work. If you don't have the skill to do that particular research method, either forget about it or learn properly how to do that research method. I see too often people using the wrong research method under the wrong paradigm. I as an editor can tell them, you're using the wrong paradigm. You're using the wrong epistemology. Go and read methodology books, please. If you're doing research in uh, another country, make sure that you speak the language fluently. Check as editors and all, and all as reviewers, and you can ask them, hey, do you speak the language, the, the other language? As editors, we can do that. And if they don't do that, make sure that they do a double translation from the original language to the other language, and then by another person, from that language back to the original one and see if there is something that is lost in translation. I don't know how often you come across any papers like that in your journals that have a duality of language or can be moved from one language to the other, but it's a, a thing to consider. Uh, for those of you who are involved in sustainability research, for any transdisciplinary research, we have some of these issues that are very, very hot. We have a large of academic disciplines. You pick up the journal of clean production and I think they're passing around. I'll put this one over here. You just look at the titles, look at, at the content, and you'll see the broad nature of sustainability. When we're talking about economic, environmental, social, and time dimensions and the inter interlinkages, including culture, history, uh, illiteracy, environment, uh, GDP, and all of those things, it gets complicated. Very complicated. That's the third point. It's valid for every research paper. How do you keep the balance between where to put the commas and the whole structure of the entire paper? I have colleagues who are so gifted on picking out all the little mistakes, all the T's that are not crossed, of course they're crossed now by the computer, but uh, I suffer from a, a, a disease called finger dyslexia. I type way too fast and because I'm typing and not looking at the screen, sometimes I write T instead of, of N or N instead of T. I don't, I don't think it's recognized by the medical journals yet. I can't pick it up because I'm thinking of the whole. I developed that skill. My colleagues are very good <coughs> at the details. But when it comes to looking at the whole, there are challenges in that sense. So, find out who you are and then you can work with people who are complementary to you. Of course, writing is linear. Check on your papers, the papers that you're receiving, that there's proper logical linear flow in the paper. We all know that research is never linear, right? It's never linear, but the writing is. And you have, the authors have to be able to translate that non-linearity of research to linearity of writing. And balancing the conventions, the traditions with new research. And sometimes in the journals we are so stuck in our ways that we want, don't want to try new things. But those new things are the original and unique contributions. So they have another paradox. The data analysis, of course, is going to be dependent on your research design, your research method. We have <coughs> hundreds of data analysis methods, from t-tests to one another, to grounded theory, to content theory, to hermeneutics, to um, observations to blah blah blah. Make sure that the authors use the appropriate method, recognize the advantages, disadvantages and limitations that we'll talk in a little bit. Uh, 
Some of these limitations include the operational ones. Uh, for example, um, limited access to interviews and all of those things. The authors have to acknowledge this. Validity are to resource or the funding valid. You have history, the threats, testing, instrumentation, mortality, maturation, ambiguity, cost of ambiguity, value, cost of effect. I don't see a lot of papers in the journal that fully address all these issues. I keep on asking all the authors to do it, to go back to the methodology books and read and talk about your validity, your reliability, your generalizability. Hey, I look, only looked at a sample on uh, uh, school students in Slovenia. Can I generalize that to the whole of Europe? Can I generalize that to the whole of Slovenia? If I'm only, only, only looking at one higher primary school in Maribor, can I generalize the whole thing? Very simple. You know, authors do that. They could put, these may be generalizable to blah, blah, blah. Maybe. There is a difference between maybe and it is. And you have the uh, reliability questions. Subject error, subject bias. Observer error and observer bias. Even in the natural sciences, the observer might be biased. The observer might have made mistakes. They need to acknowledge that there might be a possibility of a mistake. We go back to this only. Don't forget <coughs> that they have to be coherent. Make sure that your authors know about methodology books and that they follow the right paradigm, the right research, design, research method, data collection, data analysis, and all, and that acknowledge the limitations of all the paper. I did show you the traditional structure, right? For me, on the many papers I've read, many papers I've edited, in the introduction, you provide your background. What's the problem? What's the overall context of this? You kind of set up the limits on that. Your literature review, you write what other people have written about that particular problem. You narrow it down a little bit more. On your methods, you narrow it even more. Yeah? Then you provide your results and, and, and findings. There's a big difference between results and findings, strictly speaking. Results are for quantitative and findings are for quality. You may have in the same heading results and findings. That is when it, you've done more quantitative and a little bit qualitative. If you've done more qualitative and a little more quantitative, you can put findings and results. Yeah. Then you have the discussion. A good discussion will link your results or findings to the literature review. And you have three options, more or less. You concur, you agree what, what other people have said, you disagree or refute what they have said, or you complement what they have said, more or less. I keep on telling my authors, don't add new references in the discussion. Don't add them. Just Make sure they are in the literature review so that you can lean back to them. And in the conclusions, you link back to your introduction, to the broader context. And you specify what's original, what's unique of that paper, and what are the implications. If you follow those tests or as an editor, it will make your life a lot easier. What's the background? What have other people written about? What was done? How was done? How was it done? What are the limitations? Are they presenting the results correctly? Are they linking to the literature in the discussion? And finally, the question, so what? Sorry, that's a mistake there. It should be conclusions. Plural. Discussion singular, conclusions plural. Always, in English. I know that some journals make the mistake of putting discussions after conclusions. In English, that is absolutely incorrect. Conclusions are the things that conclude 
are finalized in English. You may discuss things in the conclusion, but that's not the point. Does anybody have any ethical issues? Tricky question. Has anybody ever faced uh, ethical issues in your jobs, in your submissions? Who has not faced any ethical issues? You know all about those things. You know about COPE? I think it's over there. Um, I'll try to remember. There's um, an association of all of the all the different publishers that sign up to COPE, which is um, something to do with ethical issues. I can't remember what the acronyms are. But they deal with all, they set up all the ethical issues for publishing. Some of the traditional ones, typical ones, multiple submissions, redundant publications, plagiarism, data fabrication and falsification, improper use of humans or animals, and improper author contribution. <coughs> Should be something else in there. I hope it appears and not I'll bring it up. Why do we need peer reviews? We all need peer review. we all use peer reviews, right? Which type of peer review do you use? All kinds. <laughs> all kinds. Okay. You use one, two, three, four. Slovak, German, French, Slovenian. It is not our responsibility. 
It's our responsibility as reviewers and as editors to check that it passes, but not to correct all the time. Does it build from previous one? Is there anything that has been omitted in the paper? And I'm, I'm putting the reviewing part there because we as editors are also fashion reviewers. When I get a paper in the journal, the very first thing that I do is I run it through cross-check. They authenticate so. Okay? If the number is too high, then I start getting worried, and then I might send it back to the author with a notice and say, hey, watch it, you're close to plagiarism. After that, I read and type it, scheme read, okay? become really good at quickly reading everything and picking up if there are commas missing or what's missing. And then I say, okay, these are things that need to be corrected before I send it to the, to the reviewers. For example, no acronyms in the title, no acronyms in the abstract, uh, abstract in one paragraph. Those are the guidelines that we have in, in our job, in the journal of clean production. So checking those things. If it passes my first screening, then I send it to the reviewers. 21 days later, or two months later, I get the answers from the reviewers. Before I read the answers of the reviewers, I check the paper again. I read it and I make my own comments. And then I check them against what the reviewers have said. So, you could say that in reality we have four reviews. The editor and the reviewers. Mine may be broader, mine might have to do with style, mine might have to do with some editorial things. Sometimes with things that are missing. No, not as detailed as some of the reviewers. Sometimes I am, but in general, I keep a broader mind. Because I say, well, I trust my reviewers. They're doing a good job. Sometimes they're not so much aware of the structure of what we're asking. Sometimes they may not be aware of methodology versus methods. So I complement with that. If they do it, fine. I just delete a couple of lines. That's why I'm bringing out the review in the role. Most of us have this type of decisions, right? Accept. I've edited more than 200 papers in the journal of current production and lost count. I've never seen an accept in the first, in the original version. Never. I've seen two papers with minor changes of extremely well-known professors. Over 200 papers. So that's 1%. Then it's more or less the same between major revisions and reject with a recommendation to resubmit. We pride ourselves of being a friendly job. We keep our quality high, but we want to help our authors learn, and our reviewers also learn. Yana can tell you, other people have, can tell you that we want to have good papers of good quality, and we know that not everybody has had the opportunity to attend a workshop or write properly, or have the skills to do that. And then, of course, we have to reject our score. Seldom we do that very, very seldom. So, between the major uh, and the reject, somewhere between 50 50. Give or take, depending on how you count. But sometimes to reject it comes back. When we ask for a reject with a resubmission, we ask the authors to put before the manuscript an answer to all the reviewers and the editor's points. What's the difference? That one. It's about 30 days for the author to revise. That one, 60 days. And if I, as an editor, consider that the work requires more than 60 days, of course, quality, methodology, results, and all those things, then I ask for a reject with your recommendation to restore it. Sometimes it is because they haven't cited the right, the right literature. So I add up all the different sections, all the different comments from the reviews, and then I decide. It's not really me who decides, it's the reviews who decide, and then I take a final decision. But we all do that, right? Do any of you do desk research, uh, reject? What? Desk? Desk reject. Before the, before the, before the reviews. reviews. Yes. Yeah. We have a policy not to do it. We may send it back to the author, saying you need to work on this and this and this. We have a policy of contact. Some people tell us, but you're crazy, you give yourself a lot more work. We say, yes. That's the policy of the chief editor, that's the policy we're going to keep on. 
We have number of yes. What about the external reviewers? They can complain. They are sending very bad paper. Yes, they complain most of the time. Lot of the times. That's why we have now the option of sending it back to the office. If the paper is so bad that you're like, well, you know, it's not going to pass the review. I don't reject it. I send it back to the office and say, I'm giving you the opportunity to work on it, and these are the points that you have to work on. Many authors decide not to do it, many authors decide, yes, it's, it's work. And once they do it, once they revise, then you send the paper out to reviewers. Sometimes. I had a case from a particular scholar, send the paper, the reference, the reference is not wrong, being the Lapur, the aspect was not written in, in, in one paragraph, there were a number of issues. I sent it back to the office. A couple of weeks later, they sent exactly the same paper. I copy-pasted exactly the same comments. Sent it back to the office. A couple of weeks later, sent back the same paper. Sent back, copy-paste. By the fourth one, I said, if you don't do these corrections, I'm going to reject them. That's not really a desk reject per se, but it's equivalent to a desk reject. Hey, I'm giving you all the opportunities you want that you can take. After four times, don't waste my time, please. We all, we're all really busy people, right? Don't waste the time of the reviewers, time of the editor. So we have those um, guidelines if you want to have a look at them for authors for online training and tutorials and information for reviewers and also we have a webpage on ethical issues on those things that uh, you might want to have a look at those. And as I said, I will make this presentation available and um, pretty young if you can email her. Uh, or I can email it to you with a link in or whatever. We can sort that one out. Well, JP. Any questions? Are we all still alive? Yeah, I have a question about uh, open peer review. It's something that yeah. interests me very much. Yeah, the, mm, yeah that was the long, that's the long version of, of those things and also for the ethical issues. Um, because the other PowerPoint is about 180 slides. We need a whole day for that. And I know that you're all very busy, so I'll make, that, make sure that that one is also available to all of you. That's the one that I use for authors. Uh, open um, types of reviewers. You have the completely open, so that the author knows what the reviewers are, and the reviewers know who the author are. You have the single blind, we operate on a single blind. The author doesn't know who the reviewers are, the reviewers know who the author are. And then you have the double blind. Many journals prefer the double blind especially in disciplines that everybody knows who everybody else. But then again, you can read somebody's papers, you can immediately detect by the way they write, whether it's uh, Dr. Jones or um, Professor uh, Putin or whatever. Not that he's professor, but yeah, there might be a Professor Putin somewhere in Russia. Um, so that's some of the things that we have. Okay. I thought it's uh, something different. I thought that uh, there is a possibility to carry on peer review uh, so that many people contribute to the paper somehow. Uh, with like the paper is published in a, some open document and uh, everybody can comment on it and so on. That's a thing that has been tested. Um, it's some, some sort of a wiki peer review type of thing. Ah, okay. Wikipedia is based on that. But then. If I get a paper that cites Wikipedia and you send it back and say, hey, that's not an academic record, then testing some things, different journals and different things, mm -hmm. I don't think it will work. Mm -hmm. Because then people start saying, no, but that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And it doesn't really get anywhere. For me, when I act as a reviewer, and I'm in a good mood, if I'm in a bad mood, I try not to act as a reviewer, because then you can be reading me. What I want to do is I want to, get to help the authors make a stronger paper. And I appreciate when I, as an author, get reviews that say, yes, but you could learn more from this and this and this, learn more. Mm -hmm. And if we all take that attitude as editors and as reviewers, 
our authors would really appreciate about the learning process. And we've gone through learning processes with um, authors, sometimes four or five reviewers, and we've really tried to help them. Sometimes we don't really make it. Sometimes. Not often. I've had two papers in that case, came to the fourth revision, I had to reject it. Four revision. That was one and a half years wasted on the office side. Each one. They got really angry. I said, yes, but please read your paper through the different lines. The last version. I, well, I had a Skype work conversation with somebody from Australia in that case. And I said, look at the paragraph. Does that lead to the next paragraph? He said, no. And to the next paragraph. He said, no. And to the next one. No. He said, why did you do that? Oh, I answered to all the reviewers' points and I added all the reviewers' comments. I said, yes, we ended up with Frankenstein. Yes. We can tell a reviewer, you're wrong, as an author. You're wrong because such and such and so and so, and because you're, it's not within the scope of this paper, you didn't understand, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But don't just take everything from the review, from all the reviewers and put it together. That's as, as authors. As editors, we have a duty of care of pointing out to which side it should be. But then again, maybe you have two reviewers who have contradictory opinions. I could say A, but maybe B was right. So you have to also leave it to the author to decide, okay, that or that. Or maybe they decide to go for A, and then later on they write A or B. We can't really force them on that side. We can help them to learn and write better papers, but not force them. Can I have a follow-up question today? What do you do then when you have two reviewers? One of them says, yeah, it's, it's good, maybe some minor additions. The other one says, that's really not, not good. Do you then, as the, an editor, communicate back when you, for example, decide, yes, this is a good enough paper? Do you actually talk to the reviewer who said it's not worth publishing to kind of keep the um, um, not relationship? Or? What, what I do is, well, you know, with three, it's easier than with two. Yeah. It should be. Sometimes I get published, minor amendments do not publish. <coughs> How do I decide? I invite somebody else. And when I invite somebody else, yes, it takes a little bit longer, but then I make the case stronger. Sometimes the other one says, do not publish. You're like, oh, I ended up with two publish and two not publish. And then you really have to read the paper and say, okay, which way should it go? Of course, I as an editor cannot just decide this way or that way. I have to base my decision on whatever the reviewers are saying. Because if it comes to the wash, the author can go to Elsevier and they can complain. And if I have all the documentation and say, oh, publish, publish, do not publish, do not publish, and then I've communicated with the author in that way and that way, then I cover my back. I learned that in the UK. Always have documentation of what you've been doing. And as editors, I've heard really scary stories of authors suing personally the editor and taking them to court, asking for money back because you didn't publish my paper and I lost the promotion and I lost money and so on and so forth. Are you insured? No. But Elsevier promised me that under the code we are protected. But then again, depends on which country. In the Netherlands, there's not such a problem. In the US and the UK, Was the role of non-reviewed material in your journals? There are just two pages of a review in 140 pages. So do you think that there should be more or less of non-reviewed material? Or do you think that there is kind of service to community to publish reviews? And Both reviews and things like that? Yes, it serves. We get maybe one book review uh, per volume, sometimes none, sometimes two. They are important because then you communicate in a different way. Uh, recently we got one of a book review. I edited that one. You don't really check for references, but you check for English. You check that everything flows, that they're doing a proper 
critical review of the book <coughs> and then po pointing out to the positive and the negative. It takes me less than 20 minutes to do the check. It's only one and a half pages. It's good because when you get a, a different uh, <coughs> communication. We also have letters to the editor that they are peer reviewed, sometimes by three, sometimes by one. Um, what else do we have? We have educational initiatives that are also peer reviewed, they're a little bit shorter than normal papers, but we have different ones. They're important, yes, because you the thing with books is that less and less people are reading books on that book, unless it's textbooks and then you force your students to read it. So if I don't hear about a book, how can I read it? And if I read a book review and I see A, the book review is good, it's giving me in 500, 1000 words a summary of the book, I might go and buy it. So you have no um special policy on this, so sometimes if you want to have yeah. so many in a bridge, you know. No, it's okay. Um, no. What we try to do is having, for example, not having too many comprehensive reviews in one volume. It has happened that we have to put two or three for technical reasons. But we don't like it because then you lose the flow. So we want to have a big comprehensive review together with um, papers of a similar topic. But now it's also changing because Elsevier is forcing us to go into, how do they call it? I forgot how they call it. Uh, before we had to wait until we had enough papers to compile a volume. Right now, as the papers are coming, they're being put in a volume. They're being published online. The year, volume, issue, and page number. As they're coming in, they're coming directly. So they're just filling in, and when that volume is ready, they, they print. The different style. We don't know how that's going to work. Who decides on the collection of the goes into print? Is are there any selection processes? Uh, well, the collection are all the ones that are peer reviewed and that are ready. Then, for the last months, I've been selecting where do they go. This is the editing of the publisher. No, it, we were doing that, but with the new system, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But they say it's quicker for the authors, the authors are asking more, mm -hmm. more speed and more, more so, hey, I don't know. You know, Elsevier is a big company, a lot of journalists, as you have shown. Why they don't adopt uh, the standards, like ISO standards for the writing. You know, this is one is the form and everything. Uh, we the the other is, uh, for example, you have not mentioned the quantities and units. Uh, and uh, this is really, you know, something what we have to somehow uh, come to, to a consensus, yeah? You know, not to spend so much time on different names and uh, symbols. We, and we are academics. If you have, for example, reference styles, you have more than 300. Mm -hmm. From Harvard to numerated to Nature to Journal of Clinical Production to APA to MLA. We're not going to agree on that. I'm happy because then I, I can get my students doing one or the other or the other or the other, depending for what. In an engineering paper, I don't like to see author date because it just breaks the flow. Now, all the paper of social sciences, if I just see numbers, it just does provide the, the, the right flow. That's on the referencing system. Now, we've been fighting against this new system of as they come in, we get them published. That's one job. The other journal say we want it. Yeah, but they're dealing with 50 papers a year, 500 papers. We're dealing with that. So each journal is a reflection of the character of the chief editor. Some chief editors want to have thousands with a comma, some have with thousands with a dot, some want to have American units, some want to have British units, some want to have metric units, some want to have Martian units. We're all humans. I have no other answer video on that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? What is the procedure or what type of recommendation for a journal to get a contract with, for example, Xavier that Xavier published a journal? I don't know, because I know the journal 
of my introduction, when the chief editor started that one, he went two years trying to find a publishing house. Everybody told him, you're crazy, that's never going to be a good journal, it's never going to pick up. So he went from, uh, he always keeps us the story, keeps telling the story, but I never remember it correctly. One editor, one journal, one uh, publisher, and then that publisher got bought by another publisher, and then that publisher got bought by Elsevier. So in this particular case, it was fine, no fine, no fine. Uh, in other cases, a particular professor or associate professor proposes a new title with new, new aims and scope. Then that goes through a peer review process, same as a, as a, as a journal, send it to three, four, or five different experts in the field who say, yes, we need that particular science, yes, and so on and then they decide to launch it. Uh, I'm in the editorial board of a Latin American Journal of Sustainability, blah, 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 blah. They still haven't published anything. They started last year. They're not getting uh, papers. It's getting tougher and tougher. In Alsovia, they say that if any journal passes, after, it's still alive after three years, it's going to still be alive. They lose, they start a number, large number of journals and they die very quickly. Uh, they say that the editors lose the will to live sometimes. They say, oh, well, it's too much work. I have to change after the job, the, the, the papers. I have to change after this. I have to change after that. I have to change after the reviewers. I don't have time to do it. Being an editor, and all my colleagues here can tell you, it's a really rewarding job. It's a really interesting job, but it's a very, very demanding job. And we're usually, and please contradict me if I say the wrong things, we're usually on the page for the amount of work, right? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, we, I do it because I really love to read. I really love to help other people make the papers better. Right? But some other people just hate it. I'm coordinating a special volume with three different streams. Two of the coordinating our managing editors have told me we like the experience, but we will not do it again. It's very demanding. I did answer your question, right? Yes. Yeah. Could you please describe the technical infrastructure of a serial publisher as handy for you as an editor? Like when you deal with so many submissions, so many reviews, sure it's not done. So They have billions of dollars to start with. It's a company that has been established for 300 years. They managed to survive, they managed to pick up good journals. They have the EES system. I showed a little bit of that one. Which is some sort of a database of the things, how they run. As I say, it's not perfect, they changed it to eVice. I haven't seen the version of eVice. We can communicate somehow through email through the system. Sometimes I communicate through my university email, but they do have a platform there. Previously, about four or five years ago, we had to do everything via email. Mm -hmm. Now, we, most of the journals are changing to, to some sort of a platform. Wiley has done it, Springer has done it, LCV has done it. Some of them are very similar, some of them are a little bit better. Then again, each journal, each editor can decide what to ask from the authors of the reviews, at least on the answer you want. May, may, may I have a comment on this question? Because uh, I have uh, tried this editorial system as an invited editor of the Elsevier. And uh, on the other hand, I have uh, also our own editorial system within Envigogica, yes. And the f former one is, of course, uh, EES, which uh, has been somehow bought somewhere or something like this, that, and the other one is uh, Open Journal System, which is available for free. Uh, it has been produced by Canadian government uh, or uh, supported by Canadian government, and I, I must say that there is not so big difference between these systems. There, they have many, many similar options. Maybe this, uh, maybe this Elsevier will be upgraded now, but. Uh, it was not 
uh, at all perfect at, at that time when I was editing the journal because, for example, what what didn't work at all was uh, uh, there were some databases of reviewers and I tried to invite reviewers through these databases and it simply didn't work. They never uh, answered me. So I had yeah. to have my uh, own reviewers and so on and so the systems are, are technically more or less. We, I get access to all of the LCDS databases to invite reviewers. I can also include authors who are not set up as reviewers. But somebody has to clean those databases frequently. Yeah. And that frequently may mean once a year, sometimes once every two years. Sometimes we simply don't have the time to ask the person who's coordinating everything in India to clear it. Because you have to do tests of is the email still valid? Uh, how can you name that the email is still valid? You have to do a ping, and I don't know how they do it over there. And you have to clear it. I can create those ones who I invite a reviewer, and then I get a message back and say, hey, it's bounced back. Then I can email it to the person in India and say, please delete him or her from the database. That's one. We're talking about thousands of reviewers, authors. Another question. How much feedback do you get from Elsevier about uh, your journal's usage, like from libraries? From we can get a lot of feedback from them if we want to. There are some numbers over there. Let's see if I can get them. Do you have another question? Yes. Do you check the authors? Uh, in which sense? Uh, We are getting stronger, more, um, more picky on that sense, especially from China where we get some emails that you're like, well, you know, it's a one, two, three dot com. Hey, that's not a real university address. Uh, we've been warned by the guy who manages a lot, a lot of journals. Be careful when they just put a name and no affiliation and the email doesn't seem to be from the university. So we're keeping an eye always on, on to that, especially from countries like China, Iran, and places like that, that you're like, okay, it might be a little bit dodgy. Of course, it can be dodgy from anywhere, but hey, um, we do have to check. Um, so, I don't know if you've ever seen that one. Um, that, that's the Journal of Game Production web's web page. Uh, you have the most downloaded articles that gets up updated often, I think every six months. And we have the metrics here, that's a brand new function. We have the impact factor uh, in different measures, the SNP, the impact factor, the five-year impact factor, SJR, uh, uh, article influence, so all of that is there. Of course, we as editors get a yearly um, feedback from the manager, that's part year B, on all the subject editors, all the articles that have been rejected, so it's very detailed. But only the chief editor and I get to see that one. Mm -hmm. Downloads of each article, downloads of, uh, um, from which country, so all of that. Um, we can also check for the authors there, I think. Overview of authors, that's where do they come from. So that's the graph that I showed you previously. They're including more and more metrics on Elsevier. I remember they uh, it's a very wealthy company. Extremely wealthy. 
I think the CEO got uh, bonus of more than five million dollars last year. Not that we're happy because we're all doing the work for them. But uh, <coughs> that's the uh, <coughs> thing the influence of communication is the wrong somewhere. I just <laughs> now for my for example for my position, the associate editor position, I started in January. But I signed a contract uh, just a couple of weeks ago because we were negotiating. negotiating. I was going to say fighting, but it wasn't. Really <laughs> yes, and you, it's always, though they want, they want to give you a couple of hundred uh, euros, and you say, well, a couple of hundred euros doesn't buy me anything, doesn't pay any of my time. And I'm working on weekends, I'm working at nights, I'm working when I wake up, doesn't buy me my time. And as an associate editor, I'm expected to do edit more than 500 papers a year. They just count how many papers a week is that? One euro per paper. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe two. Or maybe one of, why not a hundred? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you have to negotiate with them and you have to tell them, well, I have to teach, I have to do research, I have to do that, and then you are, you, you tell them. If you don't pay me that, I can't do it. Okay. So, no rules? Or what? In negotiation? Of course yeah. not. No, I mean, the Elsevier could have a rule. They do Depending have on the you know, number of articles, the impact factor, they whatever do have, you want. They do have unwritten rules. Mm. And they're very clever because they are Dutch, British company, and whenever it's appropriate, they use the Dutch part, and whenever the British, Whenever they needed, they used the British side. Mm -hmm. yes. Any other questions, comments? Have you all had a look? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the impact factor of the, the alternatives, which is now produced by Scotus, uh, some journals read it to the author of the same style, and the other side gently or gently pushed to cite the same journal for the last two years. I think it's rotten and I think it goes against transdisciplinary. On the other side, the higher the impact factor, the more papers you, you get submitted, the more quality you get. So that's why we have all the different uh, metrics. Because the age factor I disagree with. That's almost being incestuous. You cite the own papers on the own journal. Hey, but there's science being written somewhere else. So please go on cite it. That's the impact factor, that one, which is the age factor. You can see three point something. But I did a, an analysis of this one plus a bunch of other ones for the journal, and I sent it to the chief editor. Then you have the five year impact factor, which is the same one for over five years. Then you have the Eigen factor, which is an alternative one. As you can see, it's been increasing. Mm -hmm. Then you have the SNP and the SJR uh, 2008. So that's why you. you really need to use different alternatives to try to come up with the same metrics. Um, that's again another one of the, the ones. As I said, I disagree with the, the way that the age index is being used. It's just one of the many different metrics, it's a metric. Don't stretch it more than that. Again, as authors, as PhD students, we're being asked by our universities to publish on higher impact factor journals. How do they measure it? Age index. What about all the new open access journals? That's why they're not picking up, because everybody else is being pushed to the big old journal. And the, the small ones they don't pick up. No, not in the Netherlands. 
not not as governmental thing. Again, depends. <coughs> See, you make me. It depends on your research, what you research on, and is your research local, regional, within which context. Uh, some <coughs> some of the research in Central Europe, I would expect to be in Czech, German, Hungarian, not so much in English. There are a number of sustainability-oriented journals, for example, Gaia, that is 50-60% German, and the rest English. If you want to have an international impact, English. Not even French, not German. German that was uh, prior to the First World War. One of the best scientists back in all Germany, writing in German. Right now it's English, lingua franca. How, how much do you reserve? Does the journal help your authors with English, with uh, like the various editing um, processes? Me? Practically not. I tell them, work with a native English science editor. That's 98% of the time. Now, if they're just on the last meters of getting it done, but you just feel that no, they can't do it anymore, then I would say, delete that, correct that, or delete that, correct that. Not more than one page. I don't have the time to do that. And we have a number of services, paid services, or friends who should do that. It's not my responsibility. But you work with a pool of editors or I mean proofreaders or translators or yeah, I understand. I tell the authors there are many other many services, choose one and use it. Sometimes they do a really good job, sometimes they don't really do a good job. I would suggest the authors to get one that gives you a guarantee. Because some don't give you a guarantee. You pay 300 euros, and the next time it comes back and says, work with an English native science editor. You have to pay another 300 euros. Some tell you, you pay the 300 euros, and until it is accepted, we will check it. If, if it comes back saying, you have to work in English, check it again and again and again and again. But you don't have any lector at the Elsevier, which would check the paper after we, submission from your side? I check it, Don checks it, and we still not happy, we send it back. There are some services in Elsevier, they have paid services, of course, 150 something like that, euros per document. Some charge per word, some, char some charge per document. I particularly am um, very lucky, I have a very good friend who is a philosopher, scientist and everything else, native English speakers. Well, I send it to him and then I buy him a couple of beers and he's happy. <laughs> or I go to Slovenia, bring him a nice bottle of Kaube uh, uh, and he's more than happy. Can you get it in email address? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I could, uh, just that don't, I don't want to overload. <laughs> if, you, if any of you really want it, contact me by email and then we can do it. Because otherwise he'll end up with so many things. He, want, he is very, very picky. He wants to be very good at doing what he does. And he does take his time. So if you send him something for tomorrow, he won't do it. He needs at least a couple of weeks because he tries to understand what's written, and then rewrite it, and then understand what the language of, of the of of the author is. Yeah, you know, this is a market as everything. So you have some sort of <coughs> approaching uh, the optimum. Yeah. Yeah. This is the language. Uh, this is also the, the style. Of course, this is dependent on the on the field also. Yeah. But in within one field, there is a convergence. Yes. And so is the, uh, you know, the nomenclature and uh, everything else. And so what is, you, uh, as you mentioned, the, the, the references, yeah. There are several uh, methods, but you are approaching one which is exact and short. We use something... So no mistakes, enough information, but not That's using right. three lines if two are enough. That's writing in English, properly writing in English, but in writing in any language. If you take any of the greatest writers, some of the Viennese writers in, uh, prior to the, in the 1930s, 
There was one, I forgot his name, not... Um, um, uh, Stephen, uh, Stefan Zweig. He used to go to Greensteidel in Vienna with his big document, and then he would start and cut it down in half. I can say the same thing with half of the words. I think it was Stefan Zweig or one of his friends. If you can say the same thing with this word, say it. Okay? There are a number of rules of writing in English. I think in my computer I have some, I'll try to make them available for all of you. For example, in uh, colloquial English, I can say to study uh, the shape of the chair, I'm going to do the and that. So, uh, do, to do this and that. In academic English, you don't start with that. You don't start with to study. You start with the noun. You, are, you write the article, the noun, and then the verbs. As in proper academic English. A lot of people do the other way around. To study so and so. Wrong. Now, a lot of people, especially non-native English speakers, like to use on the other hand. Guess what? We have two hands. You have to say on the one hand and on the other hand. Or better, don't use any hands and write more elegantly. There's a lot of things that you know, I've been picking up, reading and reading and reading and reading. Things like methodology versus methods. I've made the same mistakes. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it is right, you can say the same thing with half the words, but the authors realize they can say the same thing with the double or triple of, of the same of mm -hmm. words, and they write instead of one, two or three articles. But you have this experience, and how do you try to avoid people minimizing the contribution to make more for publications? I haven't experienced that, but uh, that's why we have the comprehensive views. Hey, put it on the one thing. You might have more, more impact with one paper than in two or less points. And of course, if you check the each index of each uh, author, it's better to have one really good quality development than many of the other one. Of course, that depends on how we count when we go back to the informatics. Um, where we don't want the authors is to keep on recycling the same thing over and over and over again. So, a couple of last questions, or are we all, all ready for, to say that's it? Okay, well thanks a lot, I'll make, the, make sure the files are available for you. Any questions, do email me at the email. Thank you very much, and uh, I will negotiate how best to uh, make the presentation available. Maybe we could put it on our website also, but maybe it's not. It's not uh, <laughs>